Well, welcome. We are going to be looking at gear today, and we're going to start with looking at stoves, uh, particularly backpacking stoves, uh, not exclusively, but almost. And then we're going to look at them by fuel options, so that you helps you uh, helps you know what kind to buy. Also, each one will go over some of the safety. Some of the safety is universal across them. All right, let's go to white gas. So white gas stoves used to be the most popular. I don't know, maybe they still are. And uh, they are the stoves that run on a liquid gas that it's often called stove fuel, lantern fuel, or Coleman gas, Coleman fuel. And you pour from a large, usually a gallon sized can into smaller canisters that you then take with you. So with the MSR stove right here, the external fuel bottle, you can get to several different sizes depending on how long your trip is. Uh, you pour liquid gas into there, you thread the, the pump onto it. Uh, to make it run, this is one of the disadvantages of, of the white gas stoves is somehow you have to prime them because you're buying and putting in a liquid gas, but before it comes out these jets, it needs to be a, a vapor. So this system, is one of the more complicated you have to prime so you give it about 15 pumps and then you open this valve then the fuel runs through this line loops through the the burner and then comes down to a jet and if it's uh cold the fuel will just pool up in this cup at the base and so you do that you open that up you get that little cup at the base about half full quickly shut this off this valve back here, and then you put a match or a lighter to that uh, liquid gas that's laying there in the cup, which is going to throw a big yellow flame, uh, which is you got to be leaning back. You can't do this inside a tent, which you shouldn't cook there anyway. And when that flame burns down, then above it was one loop of the fuel line, and that, that portion is now vaporized. So you have your lighter ready, you put your lighter, your match right over here, and then you open this valve. And now you should have vapor gas coming out of this ring and you should have a beautiful blue flame. So a little bit complicated, but uh, after you've done it a few times, it's really simple. And then this is a Coleman canister stove. Um, uh, canister is the wrong term. Uh, but a Coleman stove, it's a white gas stove. You still over here on this side has, has a, um, a fuel lid that you open, you pour your liquid gas into there, you close it. And then this pump, and because this is a steel container instead of an aluminum, you're going to pump this one 60 times. And that's a really high pressure. And that's a high enough pressure that when the liquid gas that goes through this generator and into its jet, and, and then blows out into the, the the ring on the outside. It's high enough pressure that when it hits our atmosphere, it goes to a vapor. And so after 60 pumps, you light this thing and it goes right immediately to the blue. So you don't have the liquid uh, that you light on fire and throws a big flame. Uh, Nice thing about this stove that so many people like it for is it's completely field strippable. You can tear it apart and clean because the big problem with all of these is they get soot in them from imperfect burning. And since the jets and the fuel lines are, are pretty small, it doesn't take a lot of soot. So this one's pretty hard to clean, but it also doesn't ever get exposed to that yellow flame, which is the dirtiest flame. Uh, so we, here we have a, a system that we can clean. Kerosene stoves are pretty similar to the uh, white gas stoves in that you're buying a liquid. This is a much thicker liquid. It's an oilier, greasier. Um, we don't use it in this country for this purpose, but if you're traveling third world, it's nice to have a kerosene stove. There are some stoves that are just kerosene, but mostly what we do is buy a stove that you can switch to a, a thicker, a wider opening jet and then switch jets uh, anytime you're forced to use kerosene. Uh, they're even harder to start and to prime because um, you can throw a match at open kerosene and it's not going to light. It's not nearly as volatile. So you have to carry alcohol or white gas or something else 
that you use to, or, or an alcohol paste that you use to, to prime that stove, the kerosene stove. So it's nice if you're traveling, otherwise you really don't want one. The, the, I guess the advantage is if somebody does spill kerosene on the ground, you can't just light it and get it uh, to uh, burn by just throwing a match at it. Alcohol stoves are becoming uh, quite popular. This is a denatured alcohol. It's not the rubbing alcohol. So you do buy it in a uh, hardware store uh, asking for denatured alcohol. And you could also buy it in the winter at gas stations, the yellow bottle of heat, not the other colors, but uh, the yellow bottle of heat is probably the best alcohol fuel. So the, the fuel is pours directly into a can. This is a non-pressurized can. So that brass thing with the ring off to the side, that is the actual stove and it's just a holder. So you pour the uh, uh, alcohol uh, part way up that. It's a little bit tricky to light it because you can't stick your lighter down inside there very easily without burning your thumb. So I usually stick a blade of grass down into the alcohol, lift it back out and light that. Uh, and then stick the blade back, the blade, the blade of grass back down into the alcohol to light the rest of it. Then you have to let it burn for a minute or so. The the four sided shiny thing above it is the pot holder. So you do put the stove into the pot holder before you light it. Uh, there are other styles where the holes are out to the side. So you actually the, the stove itself ends up being the, the pot holder. Uh, popular with uh, lightweight backpackers because that is a really lightweight stove and I'm going to show you a, a cat food can stove uh, coming up pretty soon. So um, bicyclists also like the stove because it's something that you can buy by the pint, uh, denatured alcohol, or maybe by the quart. So you aren't having to carry around every time you pass through a town and you're out of fuel. Uh, you don't have to stop and buy a whole gallon of Coleman fuel or white gas. So alcohol has that advantage. And up to about a week, it is lighter weight uh, than carrying any of the, even the, the smallest, lightest weight of the butane stoves that we're going to be looking at. These are butane stoves, and you can see that the you can put on a, a butane, I mean a stove head, uh, you can put on a lantern head. Uh, there are even some heaters that may fit some of these. So they are pressurized butane. Uh, they're really, really simple to work with because all you do is hold your flame, your, your match or your lighter up against the, the, the jet here uh, and then turn it on and it lights. Some of them even have little piezo clicker lighters that throw a spark that light it so you don't even need a match. Um, so these are very popular. Disadvantages are that you have a canister and if it's a long trip you might have several of them and they always take up the same amount of space. So and then you're never quite sure how much fuel is in each one. So I find that people have partially used canisters collecting in their garages. The other disadvantage of these stoves is that the fuel won't vaporize even though it's under pressure once the temperature gets you know below the freezing point of water so they're not a great winter stove where the white gas is the the far better winter stove of the ones we've talked about so far this is an example of the newer lighter smaller stoves that go with the butane that that the head right here um, is that's all there is then it then it unfolds mounts up here onto the top and then you run it uh, right through here uh, yeah it, it also you just put a lighter to it turn it open it this one does have the sparker lighter so you don't even need to have a lighter with you uh, but you can see how small this stove head is uh, it is the butane so it still has the problem it doesn't work well in the winter but after about a week this system is so small and light that it, it uh, starts being more uh, efficient in weight than even an alcohol stove on a trip that's longer than about a week. This is a, a 
historical stove. They, they no longer make it. This was a Coleman stove, but they figured out a system that had a number of advantages. So this is, I'm hoping that it comes back. That's why I'm telling you about it. Uh, it had a pickup system that is inside their special canister that would allow it to burn even in the winter. So it had an advantage there. The other big advantage, all the other canisters are not recyclable, but this one is. So this is an aluminum that's recyclable. It's closer to what an, uh, a soda can is, but it is heavier. And then this little key allowed you to pop the top off, which had the only part that wasn't uh, recyclable. So you certainly had to make sure it was completely dry. And then you could pop the top, pull the core out, and the rest of it was recyclable, which was is unique in uh, stoves. So I hope they figure out a way to bring it back. Propane fueled stoves. Uh, you don't see these backpacking very often. That canister is steel. It's pr it has to be steel because it's under a higher pressure. And uh, there are backpacking heads for these, but I just don't see them very often. But you do see them on the two burner stoves uh, for car camping and the, aren't those charming student cars. Uh, advantages here is this propane, which is the stuff that a lot of cabins run on, uh, it's still working at minus 40. So like the butane, it is a very simple stove to use, to operate. You just put a light up against where the flame's going to be around that ring and get that, get your, light your lighter, light your match, then you open a valve on the canister and you're cooking. So it's, it's a pretty easy, pretty simple system. Uh, especially good for car camping, and uh, it's it's also good when you can carry more, like on a canoeing or a rafting trip where you can carry a big double burner or a triple burner stove. Uh, sometimes you'll see people on rafting trips, especially carrying the big white canister, the the 25 gallon uh, or yeah, that's too high, but somewhere around there, uh, two and a half gallon uh, propane tanks. So we're starting to see wood burning stoves for backpacking. Uh, this one is, you can see the name there, Sierra brand, uh, or actually it's the Sierra model. It's a zip stove and uh, it just burns little sticks. So you're not carrying all that heavy fuel weight and yet you get the fire contained inside the, the stove that you can see under the pot there. You can see a little bit of flame coming out. Over there on the left, that's that's what you're burning. You're burning pencil to thumb thickness, little short two, three inch pieces that you break off. So you start collecting that just as you're arriving at camp and break it down into a bunch of little pieces uh, that you can see to the right of the stove. And then you, you keep feeding the stove. This one is also unique in that uh, there's a battery, a, a, probably a double A battery that runs a little fan in the bottom. So it's a two wall stove where it says Sierra there. Uh, there are, there's a space, there's a gap between two walls like a thermos has and there are holes in it. And then there's a little fan inside between the two layers and that fan blows air, uh, which makes it, you know, like the bellows on a blacksmith's fire uh, that makes it burn quite a bit hotter. So there's some advantage on that brand that has the, the, the fan, uh, especially if you're recharging AA batteries out there with a solar system. So uh, yeah, it, it can be a, a real weight saver. However, if there is a ban on fires, this is considered a fire and not a stove. So if, the, if you do have a ban on fires, it's not allowed. Similar to the one we were just looking at, this is another brand, this one's newer. And the biggest difference here is that plastic orange attachment to the outside uh, draws heat and it generates electricity and you, it has a USB port. So you can pour, um, plug in your phone battery or your camera battery and be charging out there in the outdoors off the, the heat from a wood stove. This is a specific alcohol stove. Uh, it's called a caldera stove by Trail Designs. So yeah, I'm promoting it a little bit. 
What's different about this one is that there is a windscreen that's designed exactly for it. The pot has, you buy the windscreen for the pot that you have, or you buy the two together. And then there's an alcohol stove down there in the bottom. It is just the most efficient of all of the alcohol stoves because the wind can't steal any of your heat. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good system. It's a very good system. Uh, another system that works is the cat can stove. So uh, you can see that this is the lightweight cat can. Um, I had to get them for my neighbors. I don't have a cat. And uh, you use a paper punch. Uh, so you can see I've written 16 by 2. So 16 um, green marks there. So of course in half, in quarters, in eighths, and in sixteenths for your marks. And then you come along and punch the uh, holes uh, for both rounds. Uh, the first round up, you know, by the by the green mark. In this case, the magic marker mark. And then the just below that, uh, you put the uh, second set of holes. So there we are with the paper punch and the finished can. There's the second row going around. Looks like that. And then you pour alcohol down into the bottom, in the inside, and of course not above the level of the holes. You light it the same way. I stick a blade of grass in there, get that alcohol on the blade of grass, light the blade of grass, and then drop that down into the stove. And then this is one of the ones, because the holes are on the side, you can put the pot right on top. Uh, so the flame, you have to let it burn for about a minute, uh, or you'll put it out when you first put the pot on. But once you get the stove going, you just can light it. So this is a stove that's almost free. So that's a pretty good price for especially a college student. Plus it's lightweight. So uh, any trip that's that's you know under than a, under a week, uh, it, this with its fuel is lighter than any of the canister stoves. One of the weight savings for the alcohol stoves is that you can carry alcohol in just a plastic bottle, just a plastic soda bottle. Um, where do you put your stove? Ideally, you want it to be on mineral soil, so there's nothing that can catch on fire if it tips over. So, uh, yeah, it's pretty easy to find mineral soil with nothing that'll burn out in the desert. Uh, other places you might have to little, look a little bit farther. The, the uh, Certainly the Alaska and other places where the vegetation is so thick, you can have to look far and wide sometimes. So here we are canoeing on a stream coming into a lake right here. And there's a gravel bar, so that also is, yeah. And because we're in grizzly bear country, this is uh, a few hundred yards from our camp. So we would canoe over to where we had our uh, food uh, for this trip. So wind is a problem with any stove. Uh, we're using just rocks to block the, the wind on this stove. It's It's got the uh, canister right below it, so you don't want to have too good of a windscreen. Um, because otherwise you overheat your uh, the, the fuel container. Uh, a lot of stoves, especially where the stove has a fuel bottle that sits on the outside, then you can have a pretty tight windscreen, not too tight, or you won't have enough oxygen in there for it to burn. But this is good enough for blocking the, uh, the most of the wind most of the time and not allowing the fuel bottle to overheat. These two stoves are among the many where the, the uh, fuel container is right below the flame, so you, you cannot use too much of a windscreen on these. You have to be really careful to not let that fuel container overheat. Safety uh, with your stove is very important, and it starts with setting up your kitchen. And what you want to do is make sure that your stove is sort of at the far end of your uh, circle of stuff that you're going to need so that you never lean over it to reach for something else. So right above the fuel bottle there, you can see the stove inside the windscreen. And then everything that I might need is uh, closer to me so that I never have to reach over the stove. I also wanna go over a bunch of other stove safety things right here, right now. Um, first one is, yeah, read the directions before lighting it. Uh, and then light the match before you turn on the stoves. Um, if second one here is if the stove is new or you haven't used it in a while, you know, light it at home before your trip. 
uh, if you're renting the stove or if you're borrowing the stove, make sure you have them light it for you and practice it a few times uh, right there before you take it away. A high percentage of the problems with stoves is just not knowing how to work it. And people think they're broken when they're usually not. Um, never, or third here is do not light a stove in an enclosed space, including a tent, tent vestibule, snow shelters, and a vehicle. Uh, you've got a couple of problems. Uh, car they all give off carbon monoxide. Uh, that's a whole, yeah, just every stove gives off carbon monoxide. Some more than others, but that's another subject. Um, and then they, they're flames. They, they catch things on fire. They tip over. They spill. Uh, gas leaks, if you overfill a, a fuel bottle, they can leak uh, once they start to pressurize. So uh, liquid gas occasionally comes out even when they're not supposed to, and that, that'll spill down the sides and throw flames everywhere. So yeah, do not run stoves in enclosed spaces. Um, let's see, number four, do not relight a hot stove. Uh, wait for 15 minutes or so until it's cool. That's a much bigger problem with the white gas stoves. Uh, the butane propane stoves uh, don't have that problem. So you can turn them off and turn them back on anytime because they don't, they are always pressurized. Where the white gas ones, if they cool off part way, then you've got a mix of gas and vapor, liquid gas and vapor uh, coming out your stove and that's going to throw a big big yellow flames. Okay, um, the fifth of these points is to not allow your gas fumes to get near any open flame or other heat sources. So keep your spare fuel bottles away from the cooking area. It's not a great idea to have stoves really close to each other. Uh, sure, you can, if you're outside, uh, you can all have a common kitchen, but you're gonna wanna have your stoves five or 10 feet apart. So, uh, so that no one's stove happens to light the fuel fumes of someone else's stove. Um, treat them really well. This is number six. Treat your stove and your fuel bottles gently, uh, both at home and around camp. And when you're traveling, don't just have them swinging and banging around on the outside of your backpack. Uh, treat them nicely. Um, also, uh, thinking of your backpack, you want to have your fuel down low because and below your food. If your food gets fuel in it, you can get chemical pneumonia. Uh, so you really cannot get fuel into your food. You cannot consume fuel. It, it, it's bad stuff. So always have your fuel uh, outside and down low, always below your food. Okay, seventh, uh, match your fuel and your stove brands exactly uh, with the the MSR, the white gas uh, stoves, that's really critical. The MSR and the SIG and Optimus all look about the same, but you're better off matching. So that's different from the butane because they have universal adapters, or not adapters, they, they are universal. So uh, they, you can match across different brands. Um, as we started there, Number eight here is don't lean your head or body or step over a stove. Uh, some stoves have pressure relief valves and they, they blow a big flame. Uh, you also, the chance of somebody kicking them, knocking them over, tipping them over. And really the number one injury on backpacking trips uh, after athletic injuries of sprains and blisters, the next one are burns and scalds from, from pots tipping over uh, or people picking up a hot pot and spilling it on themselves. Um, don't fill the active fuel tank. This is number nine. Uh, more than about three quarters full. Most of them have a manufacturer's line showing the, the height that they should go, uh, but they don't always. There needs to be space in there for the air to pressurize. So if there's a pump on it and you're pouring fuel, white gas into it or kerosene, uh, leave about a third of it. They'll, if, if there's not a manufacturer's mark, then leave a third of it for airspace for the pressurization. Uh, tenth, replace worn uh, and old gaskets. Uh, your pump is and your different fittings are going to have gaskets. Uh, not on the butane again and not on the propane, 
but the white gas stoves, uh, you need to be looking at those, making sure they're not cracked because they do, the, the fuel dries out the rubber, the plastic, and they do crack. And last one, if you do have fuel leaks all over the stove and it ignites, put the fire out by smothering it with water, sand, dirt, a pot, something like that. Don't grab the stove and throw it. Uh, try to smother it and get the oxygen out of the, the uh, area. Especially on longer trips, cooking gets to be one of the great activities that you're doing out here. Um, so carrying flour and yeast, uh, can, you can make breads and cakes and bring cake mix and yeah, just read through the, the list of things that you need to make sure you have all the parts. But this way they're dry and lightweight and easy to carry. So this bag at the gal's knee is dough that she'd made earlier in the day and had mostly paddled all day with the dough rising uh, with it tucked up inside her shirt. And then we are going to bake with it. And among the things that you can bake, uh, well, to, to get a baking system, let's get this going first, uh, a big skillet with a lid that fits on it. Uh, you can then put that skillet on the stove and put heat in from below and then get a little, before you put it there, get another little twiggy fire going that you're gonna set up on top of the stove. Uh, um, very much like a Dutch oven and putting briquettes, but instead we're gonna put Twiggy Fire on top of the uh, fry pan that has a lid. So here is uh, two stoves underneath that uh, skillet uh, with its lid and then a little Twiggy Fire on top. And we have something, quite a treat, baking underneath. This guy, little guy had to wait a while, grew up a little bit. Ah, but there you are. Now you can see sweet rolls down in that skillet uh, that came from yeast dough. Uh, they're amazing. Brown sugar and uh, margarine or oil or what we uh, made them really sweet with in this case. And it doesn't have to be just stoves. You can do Twiggy Fire baking uh, with regular fire. Pull, pull some of the coals out into uh, a spot and put your baking under or on top of it and then a little bit of a twiggy fire on top of that and that way you're baking on both sides. Uh, pizzas and calzones are probably the most popular of the things that get made and baked out there on extended trips. Uh, cooking in the winter has its special needs. So mostly butane is out, otherwise you gotta keep those inside your clothes to keep them above freezing all day long. Uh, this is a white gas stove, and the problem with any stove in the winter is you can't just set it up on the snow because it just, it always puts out heat, so it melts into the uh, snow and tips over and, you know, doesn't work at all. So here I'm using an aluminum uh, uh, avalanche shovel blade. Uh, if you don't have that, you are going to have to bring some kind of a platform uh to, to set your stove on so that it can't melt down into it. And you still, even with this, you, you still have to keep a close eye on your stove and make sure it isn't shifting uh, uh, as everything warms up. But people love camping in the kitchen, the big, or camping in the winter, because you get to build kitchens and benches and seats and tables and windscreens. So yeah, people do like cooking, camping in the winter. All right, let's move to sleeping bags. And these are gonna be a lot less technical, so things should move along a little bit faster. Uh, for backcountry use, rectangular bags, they're just too big, heavy, and not nearly as warm. So yeah, let's just forget those and move straight to the mummy bag style. These taper fit up close against your body, shorter zipper section. So yeah, the mummy bag styles uh, are what you're gonna take uh, for most of your back backcountry trips. This is an unusual model that is a, a tapered mummy bag, but still fully unzips. Um, don't see them very often. All right, there are a number of options that you get with these. So we do get a little bit technical. You can see three sizes there. They are made often in their the old standard men's side. They make uh, women's and they make children's bags. Uh, the biggest difference is the women's are usually shorter. They can usually get all of these in different lengths. And then the women's have uh, start getting wider sooner down at the hips rather than just up at the shoulders. 
so it's a lot easier to keep it warm if it fits you it's not too big otherwise you end up stuffing clothes or things down in the bottom if it's too long for you so you don't heat up as much space all right uh three season ones and winter ones usually will have a collar of some sort that uh, helps stop the drafts coming up around your shoulders uh, they should all have draft tubes that cover the zippers that drop down into place and <clears throat> because the zippers are the coldest part of the sleeping bag so you need to cover the zipper from the inside uh, the foot on a mummy bag is raised so that your feet aren't pushing up against a, a flat piece of fabric two pieces of fabric coming together so do make sure your mummy bag has a raised foot Ah, big question, down or synthetic? It really depends on the environment that you're in. Um, if it's humid, you want to stay away from down. You want to go with synthetic. Uh, if it's likely to get wet, again, synthetic's the way to go because synthetic's dry a lot easier. When down gets wet, we talked about this on our closing day, when down gets wet, uh, it just goes flat. It's like sleeping in a bag of wet oatmeal, so not very useful. Um, I find that in the Rocky Mountains, especially, it, yeah, we get thunderstorms often, but a lot of the day is dry. So it's uh, and those thunderstorms more often than not are while you're hiking. So I'll show you how to package up your sleeping bag to keep your down dry. Uh, so yeah, I kayaking, sea kayaking on the ocean, I might consider a synthetic. Just depends how easily I can keep it dry. Uh, so yeah, uh, human environments for synthetic, if you think it's going to get wet uh, for any reason, then go with synthetics. Not that they're really warm when they're wet, but they do dry out over a fire. You can wring a lot of the moisture out and they do hold some loft even when they're wet. So uh, way ahead of down. Uh, yes, this was a backpacking trip in Hawaii. The only place I've taken a backpack and a snorkel. Uh, yes, yeah, sea kayaking, uh, because I can package it so well, I do often take a down bag sea kayaking, but uh, that's a personal choice because I really, really am careful. Of it. Uh, I think most people I'd recommend a synthetic bag because the environment's humid, not just the chance of getting it dropped into the water. Storing your sleeping bag uh, it needs to be loose and open. It can be open under your bed. It can be hanging from the ceiling uh, in a breathable bag. But uh, yeah, have, have a way to uh, have it open because it's the compression that ruins and ages the sleeping bags. Aging is also one of the big differences between a synthetic bag and a down bag. Synthetic bags lose their loft in you know 10 or 20 uh, stuffing down into a compression stuff sack where you're gonna get far more years out of a down bag. You can stuff them and they recover their loft much more easily. So down bags do cost more initially, but they do last many times longer. So uh, in the long run, it's cheaper to have down, but it costs more to get started with them. Here's a very good technique for keeping all of your stuff dry, especially your down, whether it's a sleeping bag or a jacket or both. And that is to use a trash compactor bag to line the inside of your stuff sack to begin with. So the trash compactor bag is waterproof. This happens to be a waterproof uh, stuff sack as well. And I do mean compactor bags. Those They're much heavier than uh, most of your trash bags and all of your other trash bags or leaf bags or yard bags. So these are extra heavy duty trash compactor bags. Um, yeah, look, look for extra heavy duty stuff. Then I twist the, the bag. You can see on the top left there that everything gets stuffed inside and I twist it really tight. I don't usually even need a knot because it's uh, enough of a squeeze that I can then um, tuck that twisted neck down the side of the stuff sack and then tie off the stuff sack. And again, this is a waterproof stuff sack to begin with. So it rolls and buckles. Um, Additionally, I do this with my day pack. I do this with my backpack. Uh, I might have three of these compactor bags uh, on a backpack, but I, I keep, even in my day pack, I keep a trash compactor bag folded up in the bottom, and most days I don't need it. But uh, if I do get in a rainy hike, I can just move everything to the inside, twist it off, on, like you see on the bottom right there, 
and waterproof my day pack or my backpack. With backpack, I often need uh, two, two different ones, one for the stuff that I won't use except at camp, like the sleeping bag and a down jacket. And then the other things that I want to keep dry, I keep it in another bag that I may open and close several times during the day. But the down stuff stays uh, unopened until I get the tent or the tarp put up. You never know how you might get wet. It isn't always just rain and snow. Sometimes you slip and fall in. Sometimes you set your pack down and you don't notice that you just put it in a puddle. Uh, and then everything on the bottom gets wet. And here are folks doing it exactly wrong. They've got all their uh, sleeping bags apparently in stuff sacks, but then they put the stuff sacks inside uh, the trash bag. And these look pretty lightweight. So if they, you know, right here, they're okay. But if they walk under trees, they're going to snag and tear those. So having the, the waterproof uh, trash compactor bag protected by the nylon stuff sack uh, gives you protection both from the rain and from snags and tearing. All right, we're moving on to tents and shelters and sleeping systems. Um, these are three different, three uh, North Face tents. North Face did a study on which were the happiest colors and the oranges and the reds were kind of angry and the blues and the greens were cold and they went with yellow yellow turned out to be the happy color these are also winter tents or mountaineering tents you can see the rain fly comes down extra low and they have extra uh, tent poles to to help support everything uh, there are other there are one season tents there are single wall tents so there there is more than we are going to go into right here um, yeah, here's old style where we just had a pole at each end and a single wall. So you can see people have even thrown a poncho over their tent to try to cover it. And we started making our own rain flies by just covering it with uh, a plastic tarp from uh, a painter's tarp. And uh, now tents have come with rain flies. You can see that that one on the right's rain fly is completely worthless because uh, it isn't uh, covering enough and the other two should be stretched out more uh, they, they're missing some of their guy lines putting out all of your guy lines anchoring up high or things we've talked about and uh, pulling out because tents are held together by a combination of tension pulling on lines and uh, uh, fabric and by pressure of poles pushing outward the giant family tents uh, frequently did not have uh, a rain fly, but that's because humidity uh, doesn't build up as much on these because they're so big. There's just the amount of breathing in there compared to the little tents. Uh, so, uh, yeah, they're big waterproof with, without that extra rain fly. Tent poles and stakes are of concern. These are 7,000 level uh, Eastern aluminum tent poles, that's about as good as it gets. Uh, the 6,000 level ones are, are pretty good for most backpacking. I wouldn't choose them necessarily for mountaineering winter holding snow loads. With the backlighting, uh, we can take a look at the structure of a, a two walled tent. This one's rain fly is not on it right now. Uh, but that yellow fabric is all breathable nylon. There's no waterproofing. And then partway up the side walls is the brown and then the floor itself. The brown layers are uh, waterproof. They have a coating on, on those and they chose to color code them. So uh, it's easy to look at. How to use your ground cloth. This is an area that people like to argue over. Uh, this is my tent. So you can see I prefer to have my ground cloth on the inside of the tent. Uh, if I carry a ground cloth, I don't very often um, because you're going to get holes in your floor no matter what. So if I can keep putting in a brand new, really cheap, you know, $15 ground cloth, uh, it's going to keep me dry from the inside. There are other people who say, no, it goes on the outside to protect the bottom of the tent. And that's true. It does help with that. But what happens too often, you can see here is the rain ran off. The outside of the tent and hit the rain fly and they had about an inch and a half two inches of water inside their tent so that rain fly was not being effective at all for them there's quite a range of uh, uh, tent stake shapes 
and designs and what they're meant for. Those really wide U-shaped ones are meant for sand, like is in the background in that picture. The wire stake ones, which always get bent, uh, work really well in uh, good organic dirt with lots of roots. Uh, and then there are two three-sided stakes uh, in between the two styles uh, that are in between. They do a little bit of either. So here's a, a sandy campsite where the broader stick stakes are uh, very, very helpful against the wind. And, and here is a total rock campsite. Uh, not everyone chooses them. You can see the people in the background looked for little pockets of sand. But you can camp on this. Uh, hard to see at this distance, but I just carry lots of long cord already attached up high on my tents. And then I can tie two boulders. In fact, I do this so often that I frequently do not carry stakes at all because all of my tents already have, you know, eight or ten foot cords all around it. Uh, so I can find something to anchor to, carry over some boulders, uh, tie to branches, tie to sticks, tie to trunks of trees, and uh, not carry any stakes. Uh, looking at a difference between a you know a $400 tent versus a $600 tent, which is getting absurd, but you can certainly go way beyond that. The tent on the left is is still expensive. It's a $400 tent, but you can see that especially when it's wet. The rain fly doesn't fit quite as tightly. The one that's hiding in the bushes there, it's harder to tell because of the bush. Uh, but that rain fly stayed tight uh, all the time. Almost always, almost any rain fly though. Once it starts raining, nylon always stretches, polyester less so. Uh, so polyester rain flies have that advantage. Uh, but they do stretch, so it means going out there and restaking a lot of your tie down points. Uh, but at some point, the design and the cut of the fabric and the designer and the higher cost uh, makes a difference on how dry you stay uh, in a storm. This one season tent just has mosquito netting on the inside and then a good rain fly. So even though it's considered one season because there are no solid walls under that uh, rain cover, uh, it, the rain cover comes way down, so even though we had, this is shaken off later, but we, we had about six inches of snowfall, and it, it worked just fine. Over to the left there, you can see just a tarp. So this is a coated nylon. This is a pretty hefty tarp. Uh, it's pretty big. It's, we were able to sleep four or five people under it for a month, uh, of course, in various locations, never more than one, two nights. Uh, but that's about a 12 by 9 tarp, so uh, we were able to sleep quite a crowd under there. On really blowing storms, we did have to line up our packs on the windward side and block the wind that way. So when I can afford the weight and the space of extra tarps, I do bring them. So we're sea kayaking here in Prince William Sound, and we all have some extra tarps because it, you can go there and have two weeks of solid rain and it's nice to be able to get out from under uh, or get out from under the rain and under the uh, the tarp. Uh, so yeah, canoeing in the boundary waters in Minnesota, again, having a tarp, especially with kids, a place that they can get outside and play other than inside the tent, even if it's raining buckets. And university students don't seem to mind them either because here we are holding class in uh, underneath one of those 11 or nine by 12 tarps. For backpacking, uh, it's uh, pretty hard to justify carrying an extra tarp. So I started using these. These are things that I make myself. These are This is siliconized nylon. Uh, it's a roughly a five foot square. And then I put tabs on it that I could then put uh, uh, cords. And I also hem the thing all the way around. So rolled up, this is about the size of my fist, and it weighs about as much as two AA batteries. And it is so nice to be able to tuck out of the rain, even if your feet are still poking out. Uh, but yeah, it, it can save a lot of sanity on a rainy trip. So not a good way to use a tarp rolling up in it. You can see he's pretty soggy on the inside, but that tent in the background is the one where the uh, ground cloth was outside. So he actually was still drier than the people in that tent that where the ground cloth brought the water underneath all of the sleeping bags.
Uh, tarp tents of different kinds are around. These are shaped tarps, so that they are uh, cut and sewn into different shapes. And then this one has zippers, and you can either open up an end or you can open up the side like this. Uh, so it's a shaped tarp, and two uh, hiking poles are what hold it together underneath. And then after a while, they made it even more like a tent because you might be able to see underneath there that uh, they added later a mosquito netting liner on the inside so it's still pretty lightweight but it's starting to catch up to the weight of a tent now pyramid style tents are popular for some folks they give you a little more room for standing up uh well hunched over not really standing up and uh, this one they can save weight this is a four pound tent for four people uh, it also you can add to it uh, a mosquito netting liner uh, that then starts taking its weight up. And here we go. This is the Black Diamond Mega Mid. Uh, they also make it out of siliconized nylon and call it uh, something else. I uh, can't think of it. Sorry. Um, then another brand yet. So four or five different brands are making pyramid style tents. I'm going to promote another brand. I do like this company, Tarp Tent. So do if you are looking to get a really lightweight tent. So this is a single wall tent. Uh, however, it does have netting and a floor. Uh, the, the netting is just over the, the door area underneath the vestibules. There's a vestibule on each side, uh, which is really nice so people can get out because there is barely room for two, which is why they call it the double. The single rainbow is a single person tent. We've got another view of it here. So it's got one arching pole and then a cross pole and everything else is held by stakes pulling it out to uh, the corners. But uh, this gets the weight down to two and a half pounds for two people uh, compared to most of your double wall tents, which are gonna start at six and seven pounds. So uh, pretty nice. Uh, here we are waiting out a thunderstorm uh, inside that, um, uh, double rainbow so the mosquito netting you can see is just on each side otherwise it's a tarp uh, and it does it does have a floor so uh, pretty pretty lightweight way to go as I said anything for rain you've got to check the seam siliconized nylon there is no seam tape for it so you do end up having to buy a special thing called silnet uh, which is feels like clear toothpaste that you spread on all of your seams to block all the stitching holes and where the, the needle and the threads go through, um, which is a bit of a nuisance, but you do it once and it's, it's highly rubberized and flexes lasts a very long time. Hammocks are becoming more popular. They're uh, environmentally pretty nice because you hang them from a tree. So you do have to protect that tree where you wrap the rope around it, but that's more detail than we're going into. Uh, this tarp enters from below, uh, not tarp, sorry, this uh, hammock enters from below and it has mosquito netting and it has a tarp. And you can, any place you can get two trees that are about the right distance apart, it doesn't matter if you're up steep, on a steep hillside, uh, over water, over boggy areas, uh, you can hang up your hammock. Uh, not everybody likes them, it curves your back uh, and it also bends your knees backwards. So uh, not everybody does well with them. You also have to figure out a system to keep you warm from underneath because you compress your sleeping bag. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's, it's something to work on. Not everybody likes these. I have a number of bivy sacks. I, none of them are truly waterproof in a storm. So when I use a bivy sack, I also have a tarp and vice versa. When I use a tarp, I bring a bivy sack usually. Uh, so, but for the nights that it's it's clear, it's nice to be able to sleep out and away from your tarp. Because bivy sacks are waterproof, they're often Gore-Tex, they don't breathe as well. So you do get some condensation inside, which is a bit of a problem. So one of the, well, here you can see it from, because uh, we're next to a lake, so the humidity is there. And it was drier inside the bivy sack than outside but still it, it's not quite as nice as a tent. So one of the solutions you can see top left there, it's unfortunately covered at the bottom right, is a pitchable bivy sack so that uh, it 
has two poles, one at each end, and your sleeping bag never touches those walls, but that double rainbow with room for two people actually weighs less than that booby sack, so that booby sack doesn't get to go on trips anymore. Especially down in the desert, if you know your rock layers very well, you know which layers have lots of big overhangs, and you can uh, pretty safely go with just a bivy sack and knowing you're going to be under a tarp. So you're thinking about systems, not just one uh, method. All right, switching now to um, pads to, as part of your sleeping system. You can see here I've worn out two students who weren't too picky about what they, surface they were sleeping on. Well, most of us prefer a pad underneath us uh, and above the rock. So this is the simplest. So it's not the most comfortable. Great insulation. This is called closed cell foam, and they're waterproof. They, uh, the ones on the left you can see have shapes uh, that are supposed to help lift you up. I think you still end up flattening out. And the two in the bottom right, the two blue ones, are just flat. And they don't roll up very tight, but they are great insulation for cold, they're just not particularly soft. The Thermarest uh, company for, of Cascade Designs came up with this idea. There's a sponge foam uh, inside there and then in the orange, and then there's a valve up there on the upper upper corner. So you, it works as a combination of a foam mattress and an air mattress. So they're warm because they're a little bit stiff. They don't crush because you blow them up with air, and then close the valve, and that way it retains pressure on the inside. Uh, and then you don't need as much foam as when we used to sleep directly on the sponge foam. And uh, anyway, it's, it's a very warm, soft system. You can get them in different thicknesses uh, and different lengths, uh, putting your backpack or other things under your feet if you want a shorter, lighter weight one. So you have to think of your camp in systems. Uh, if you're going to be out in the open just sleeping under an overhang, you're going to need a little bit warmer sleeping bag. Uh, if you're carrying a bigger tent and clothes that you can sleep in, you can carry. You can have a lighter weight sleeping bag. Uh, so yeah, be watching out there in nature that you've always got places you can tuck in out of the wind, out of the, out of the rain, out of the snow, uh, so you're not having to carry tarps as much or uh, as big of a tent because uh, it really is nice to be able to get out from under uh, a storm. Okay, we're wrapping up here. Do take care of your gear. Always be careful you're not snagging it, dragging it against uh, canyon walls, snagging it under trees. Uh, always dry out your gear as, as uh, often as you can so it doesn't mildew. Uh, at the end of a trip, you want to haul all of your gear out and dry it probably for days which might drive your your mom your roommates crazy uh, but you do have to dry it because yeah you test the fabric but the places that are going to be the slowest to dry nobody ever checks and those are going to be the heavy nylon uh, around the zipper and then out where the stake uh, loops are stitched in you might end up with multiple three four five layers of heavy nylon in some of your seams. You've got to absolutely make sure all of those get dry because otherwise mildew uh, lives off the coating of uh, all of your outdoor gear. So here is a tent uh, who the tent was put away wet and then when the student brought this along uh, hadn't been looked at for a while and boy did it smell bad of mildew and was it not at all waterproof. Fortunately we didn't get any rain that trip. To wrap up this segment, yeah, take care of your gear, and it will take care of you. Buy good gear. It's worth spending the time and the money doing the research, talking to lots of people. Uh, and then try not to turn into too big of a gearhead, though. Not everybody wants to hear you talking this heavily about it. Uh, yes, you're there for the place, for the location, for your friends, uh, not for the gear. Try to remember that.